morning. It's really early morning here from Rome. It's about almost six o'clock here. It's still dark outside. I'm from Thailand, and that's why this is my great pleasure to talk with you today. My talk today, we will focus on the challenge of building sustainable food system. And we know that family farmers play an important role in the local food system and local food supply, the role of the family farmers in Asia. A lot of challenge that we are facing at the moment. We know that many family farmers in Asia are still facing the situation of severe hunger and also poverty. Some of them have no land or have small land, less than two hectares. In some countries, less than one hectare. In some area, even in my own country in Thailand, some of them have just only half hectare to do their agriculture. Because they are lacking access to the national resources in terms of land, water, technology, finance, and market. In some countries, when farmers need loan from the bank or from other source, they have to pay the interest rate over 20 or 30 percent, and that's why the issues of accessibility to finance is one of the key issues. And that's why some of the government, some of the countries try to have such a kind of microfinance or any other support to those farmers. And also, those family farmers are facing degraded ecosystem and vulnerability from the climate change. Some of them are facing with water scarcity. As you know, that without water, we cannot do agriculture. And once we are facing with the climate change. Sometimes they are also facing with plant pests or any other disease that they haven't seen before, and many of them never got involved in the decision-making process. They cannot choose what they want to grow. They cannot choose what they want to do for their agriculture. And many women and youth also have other problem in some countries, in some communities. That they don't have right. Some areas, some countries have cultural norms that influence the legal frameworks. That they also have to adapt themselves with that situation. As all of you know, that the COVID nineteen is impacting the global, regional, and national food system, disrupting agricultural value chains, domestic and international trade, posing risks to household food securities. And in the meantime, also COVID nineteen. Is creating a v a n i s of food securities and food safeties for producers, businesses, governments, and also for us as a consumers. But we know that during the COVID 1 9 that we are facing at the moment, the family farmers are facing specific difficulties in accessing input for production, especially in some landlocked countries. If you want to buy some agricultural inputs, you have to pay more because there is no truck to deliver agricultural input from other countries to their own countries. I can give you an example, like in Lao PDR, it's a landlocked country, which actually they rely on the input from other countries. And once the country is locked down, the cost of agricultural inputs is increased, and also the cost of transportation is increased. And also, according to the health measures, the trucks or people who enter to the countries is not allowed. Or even though they allow to enter to the country, it's just only one hour or two hours, and that's why it have create an impact. And also, those farmers are facing the difficulty in assessing the market once consumption is reduced. For example, in Philippines, when there's no tourists, and then that's why demand is decreased. They don't know where they can sell their products. And also, the movement restrictions do not allow the free flow of our products from the fields to the cities or from countries to another countries, and even how to preserve and conserve the unsold products because they don't have facilities to store their products. But we know that the family farmers also have a lot of opportunities. Some of you know that agricultural product more than 70% percent produced by family farmers. And family farmers, you are on the front line of food securities to make sure that the consumers have enough food with high qualities, and you also produce healthy food, because first you have to produce for yourself before you sell to others. And that's why in my home country, Thailand, we are implementing the concept of sufficiency economy philosophies. We always say that first, produce enough for our own consumptions. When we produce enough, we are thinking about others to share with other whatever you give them for free in the communities, 
you can form the group of many farmers and you can sell your products to others. Family farmers, you also give the opportunities to build resilience or build back better. And you are the one who really create a stronger food supply chain or local food system. And during the COVID-19, it already show us because at that time, people have a lot of panic where to get food. And that's why family farmers play an important role to strengthen the local food supply chains, the local food system. Because you have to make sure that all the food that you produce in your communities, in your household, can feed the whole communities. And you can share with others. And you always be solution because you can cope with the situation because you are in the community, you are in your territories. And that's why you know how to provide the comprehensive solution for your own communities. And once you form the group, you have the group of farmers, you have your own organization, you also can build up the economy of scale because you know that it's just only one farmers, you produce enough for yourself. But when you want to do the business, you need many more family farmers who work together to create the economy of scale that you can do better and better. You know that now young farmers, they are reluctant to do agriculture. And that's why our communities, we are entered to the 18 communities for agricultural sectors. But many more young farmers see an opportunity because now we want to have safe food. We want to have healthy food. We want to have food that are different from others. That's why those young farmers, they have a lot of ideas. They are very innovative and they take advantage of their entrepreneurship skill, their knowledge on technology and innovations, marketing, or even their traditional knowledge. And they can create the new way of marketing for agricultural products. I have seen a lot in my own countries and also in different countries. For example, in some countries, once they know that they need a cold storage, the new idea came that are oh, perhaps those young farmers, they can install the facilities for the cold storage in the village and they can keep their products longer and they can sell more to the market. We know that young generation, they have a lot of energies, they have a lot of ideas. Let them do and give an opportunity and support them in terms of investment, in terms of policies, in terms of finance, and they can do more and more. As the previous speakers already mentioned about the UN Decade of Family Farming, it's an instrument to improve the resilience, sustainability, inclusiveness, and availabilities of family farming. But we know that if the government and all of you who are farmers or farmers association don't take the ownership at the country level, if you don't translate the global framework, global action into the national actions and plans, it's just only another beautiful document that we produce. That's why the government, with civil society, with farmers' organization, you need to translate all the global action to the local action, to the national action. And you are the one who can lead the process and take the ownership of the national action plan for the UN Decade of Family Farming and work with your government. And the family farmers have us different roles in building better resilience and sustainable food system toward the global agenda 2030, which actually some of you already mentioned that family farmers play an important role to contribute to several SDGs. I can say that you work for all SDGs because you as a family farmers, you produce healthy and nutritious food for yourself and for others. And once you are in your communities in your own countries, you know that whatever you do have an impact on the natural resources. And that's why you have to make sure that you can manage the resource sustainably in terms of soil, water management. You need sustainable management. Also, you make a contribution to the community as a producer. And I think it's a lot of role that you have to play to make sure that you can build back better and to make sure that all of you are in the best positions to develop resilience to climate change or to enhance biodiversity and also to ensure the ecosystem for your own communities, for your nation. 
What is the policies and programs that you indicate of family farming at the county level or at the regional level to prioritize? I think this morning, I think it's one of the colleagues already mentioned about land right, land tenure, which actually are the work of the Committee of Wealthful Securities that we are really focused in the last 10 years that we produced the voluntary guideline on the responsible governance of land tenure is one of the key tools to support the government to look at the issue of land right. Because in several countries, in Asia, farmers have no right to get access to land. They don't have ownership. And that's why we need to make sure that if we want to do the agricultures, first, you need land. Even though now technologies, some of you may say that are oh, the new technology don't need land. But in principle, you need land. And that's why people need right to get access to land or to make sure that they have the ownership to have land for their own agricultures and also to make sure that we can promote sustainable agricultural investment at the country level when the investment come to the countries to the local communities we know that it sometimes it create other impact and that's why to make sure that we promote sustainable investment for agricultures at the country level at the community level to make sure that we protect our people and also to make sure that we need to support the investment that enable family farmers to develop resilient livelihood and reduce inequalities and also promote innovation and technologies that adaptable for family farming because sometimes when we talk about our smart agriculture precision agricultures high technologies but those technologies is not only for the big corporate, but also can be adapted for small scale, medium scale family farmers. And that's why to make sure that those policies and priorities lead to family farmers. And how CFS, the Committee on World Food Security, can help or is helping in the process of building sustainable food system and what the support the Committee on World Food Security would also want from family farming organization or a civil society organization. As you may know that the Committee on World Food Securities is the foremost inclusive intergovernmental multi-stakeholder platform to ensure food securities and nutrition. The CFS with its internationally negotiated global policies provide to the government and other stakeholders with guidance on how to ensure the participation of smallholders, family farmers, Because at CFS, we provide space for family farmers to echo your voice, to speak what is your need. And also we want to bring the concrete solutions and directions for sustainable food system. Because this one is a very unique platform, it's not only the government or the members to talk, but we give opportunity for civil society, private sectors and others to talk the issues of food securities. And that's why you can echo your voice at the Committee on World Food Securities. And some of the work the CFS have produced to support the government, to support you as farmers, as I mentioned, one of those is a voluntary guideline on the responsible governance of tenure of land. Right now, with support of FAO and other UN agencies, this guideline has been translated and support the countries to help them to have the land reform legislation, to help them to help farmers to make sure that they can get access to land and 140 countries already adapted this concept. And also others are principles for responsible investment in agriculture and food system that I mentioned earlier. We need a guideline to help the government to make sure that we have a responsible investment in the countries at the local communities for agriculture and food system. And also there are several reports and policy recommendations For example, this year we are working on policy recommendation on agroecological and other innovative approaches. And also now we are negotiating the voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition. We are expecting that the voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition and also agroecological and other innovative approach will feed to the discussion of the UN Food System Summit and also can help us for transformation of sustainable food system. The policies is another document If we don't bring it into action, if there is no implementation at the country level, and that's why we need you as a champion to bring those global policy, global recommendation into action. 
And we need to push our government, we need to push all the stakeholders to work together to make it happen on ground. And also just next week, the CMS will have the high level special events on strengthening global governance of food securities and nutrition during the World Food Week, 13 to 15 October. And all of you are invited to join this. We want to hear your voice. We want you to echo what you need. You are one of the solution as a family farmers. And that's why I'm looking forward to see you at the high level special events during the World Food Week. Thank you very much for your attention. Ang pamilyang magsasaka